Good afternoon from Tallinn, Estonia, and welcome to the second keynote lecture of the Cultural Memory of Past Dictatorships seminar series. A warm welcome back to all of you who joined us for our first keynote lecture two weeks ago, and to our participants to the symposium that will follow this, this seminar series. I'm happy to see some familiar and to recognize some familiar names and faces in the audience, or maybe not so much faces <laughs> yet. Um, my name is uh, Diana Popa, and I am a postdoctoral research fellow with the Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past in the Global Arena project based at Tallinn University in Estonia, together with Dr. Guido Bartolini from University College Cork, Cork Ireland. We are the curators of a series of keynote lectures and a symposium that aim to explore the cultural memory of dictatorships across the globe with a specific focus on questions of complicity and responsibility, which we would like to raise by engaging with Michael Rothberg's recently developed concept of implication. Today's talk is the second of our seminar series, which consists of three keynote lectures altogether. The series started with Professor Michael Lazara's talk entitled Disobedientes Implicated Subjects, Memory and Responsibility in Post-Dictatorship Chilean Documentaries. The talk was recorded and it will be made available soon. Today is our second seminar with Professor Juliane, Juliane prade Weiss's lecture. And we finish this introductory keynote lecture series on May 4th with Professor David Martin Jones talk. Um, this seminar series will be followed by the symposium on May the, 20th, the 19th and the 20th. This series of events is generously supported by our sponsors, the Irish Research Council, the National University of Ireland, the Center for Advanced Studies at University College Cork, and the ERC project Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past in the Global Arena, funded by the European Research Council under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Today, we are very honored to have with us Professor Juliane prade Weiss, who is Professor of Comparative Literature at Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich, Germany, and who holds a PhD in Comparative Literature from Goethe, Goethe University, Frankfurt. From among her vast list of publications, I would like to refer only to those most pertinent for the topic of our symposium, today, uh, symposium and which are in English. Professor Prade Weiss's habilitation research, during which she was a DFG research fellow at Yale University, was published in 2020 with Bloomsbury and is entitled Language of Ruin and Consumption on Lamenting and Complaining. I would also like to highlight that as an EU Marie Curie Fellow at Vienna University with the project Complicity, a crisis of participation in testimonies of totalitarianism in contemporary German language literatures, Professor Prade Weiss published an article entitled Guilt Tripping the Implicated Subject, Widening Rothberg's Concept of Implication in Reading Hertha Müller's The Hunger Angel with the Journal of Perpetrator Research. In her current work, together with Vladimir Petrovich and Dominique Markle, she's pursuing, she's pursuing the project Discourses of Mass Violence in Comparative Perspective. Her talk today is entitled Implication in Commemoration on Current Interests in Past Complicities. Professor Prade Weiss, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thank you very much for zooming in. Um, I would like to screen my, uh, share my screen because that might make it easier to follow what I'm saying. Here it is. And sorry, just a second. Yes. yes. So we start. In the 21st century, literatures from Central and Eastern Europe have been marked by a boom of documentary fiction portraying complicity with Nazi perpetration, Soviet terror, and other instances of 20th century mass violence. Since understanding the past always serves requirements of the present, the boom prompts the question, why the interest in past complicities now? 
My hypothesis is that the texts address convergences between involvement in past acts of mass violence and current forms of participation in wrongdoings of humanitarian, political, ecological, or other natures in what we call neoliberalism. While these issues obviously differ in many respects, they are related in structural and historical terms. Structurally, both present the challenge of forming a nuanced notion of participation, the idea and promise at the heart of democracy, digital media, and consumer capitalism that is highly valued yet poorly conceptualized. Historically, both issues are related since justifications of past involvement have established the terminology, narratives, and heuristics in which terror, repression, and acts of mass violence are subsequently discussed by inscribing them into cultural traditions, thus forming the frame for negotiating current problematic involvement. The convergence is, therefore, of particular interest in view of the global crisis of political participation, which is currently undermined by an often unwilling but inevitable participation in detrimental economic structures that can be linked to the ecological crisis, <clears throat> the delegitimization of democracy, and the retreat to identitarian ideologies, not least in so-called memory wars. Implication of the analogy between totalitarianism and neoliberalism, however, is ambivalent. Complicities in past totalitarianisms <clears throat> may be paralleled with current problematic involvement to find models for comprehending issues of the present in cultural memory and or to understand the genealogy of forms of social interaction and their justification. This analytical approach is counteracted by hedonistic or let's say consoling readings which evoke instances of past complicities to appease the sense that all is not quite well, even after the, demise, after, the, after the demise of Nazi and Soviet rule, by drawing attention to how bad, how much worse things have been, and thus grand distancing. This effect has been studied in German mass media representations of the Shoah, which allowed to create, as one author writes, a collective memory by way of identification with the past at the price of permitting to consume this disconnected past as exotic alterity and even as a sentimental entertainment. Authorial intent cannot prevent such readings, of course, because literature differs eminently from the juridical discourse from which the term complicity is borrowed in that authorial intent is not decisive for the reception of a text. What matters is the complex relation between identificatory options offered by the text and the reader's various ways of adopting them. This relational openness is decisive, especially in the genre of documentary fiction, to which most of the texts portraying historical complicities belong. Fiction and documentation interrelate in reconstructing narratives of mass violence because non-factual or not doubtlessly verifiable accounts are indispensable to shaping a collective memory of forms of violence that aim at exterminating groups of people as well as their cultural heritage. The purpose of documentary fiction is thus neither to forge historical facts nor, or even to convey facts, nor to form juridical decisions, but to confront audiences intellectually and emotionally with complex situations of ethically problematic involvement. Works of documentary fiction rely on the fact that all reading is based on participation as texts speak to implicit readers and that literature requires the, the participation of audiences, be it the voice and the imagination of the reader or the gaze of the spectator. Fiction moreover depends on what Samuel Coleridge calls a willing dis suspension of disbelief. Documentary fiction relies on reader participation to reflect on instances of historical participation in mass violence. The point of this aesthetic reflection is neither to prove the reader's distance from a quote unquote tragic past, past nor to rule out such readings, but to draw attention to exactly the issue of distance, be it hedonistic or analytical. Both imply emotional distancing, while reading requires participation. <clears throat> 
and I want to go into this tension a bit today. In the following, I want to analyze two prominent alleys of distancing that constitute the very opposite, namely a particular form of complicity with the transmission of discourses that justify or foster mass violence. These modes of distancing are relevant because they are no mere literary phenomenon, but mirror elements of a wider social political debate on memory culture. Some texts reproduce, reproduce these modes of distancing while others reflect on them. One mode, and this is the structure of my talk, one mode is spatial temporal distancing of the commemorating point of view in the quote unquote West from the portrait violence in whatever is called the East. A second strategy used particularly when spatial distancing is impossible is moral distancing i.e. to cast the narrator and readers as morally and or intellectually superior to complicit characters. Outlining this, however, first requires a brief discussion of the concept of complicity because its complications and juridical discourse are what renders it productive, I think, in literary texts. So part one is complicity in and beyond the law. As a legal term, Complicity describes the way a crime is committed, namely by aiding or abetting wrongdoing. Yet complicity poses a challenge to the law as it undermines the principles of individual accountability and autonomous action. Dependent on the actions of a principal wrongdoer, the accomplice is still autonomous insofar as aiding or tolerating wrongdoing does make a difference. Accountability is based on individual intentionality which gives rise to a particular difficulty in current corporate and uh, international law, whereby corporate and state complicity with human rights infringement and environmental damage, for instance, often, often evade sanction because corporations and states are legally not understood to have intentions. This paradoxically renders them actors without intent under the law. Complicity thus marks the limits of legal discourse by pointing beyond the law's methodological individualism to structures of social relationality. This connectedness <clears throat> is exploited, for instance, in the totalitarian strategy of reassuring the individual's sense of guilt while undermining individual action and personal accountability, a process outlined in Hannah Arendt's maxim where all are guilty, nobody is. Declaring everyone guilty is tantamount to labeling wrongdoing inevitable and in ultimate analytical complicity to dropping the differentiation between moral choices just as it had been aborted in totalitarianism. 20th century European totalitarianism might be regarded as linked rather than as contrasting to neoliberal post-modernity and both in that both have rendered complicity, as Arendt says, a matter of course rather than a matter of decision. To move beyond methodological individualism, legal research proposes the evaluation of the causal contribution to wrongdoing independent of intent or notions such as shared responsibility or a participatory conception of collective action. What participation means, however, that's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, is a second challenge complicity entails in and beyond legal thought, because despite its popularity in political philosophy and popular parlance, participation is a defined concept neither in Leibniz, Kant, Fichte, nor in Schelling, Hegel, Nietzsche, or other notorious authors of classical modern thought. This issue is, I believe, where literary discourse can make a decisive contribution, because assessments of historical involvement and wrongdoing rely on reconstructive narratives, and conceptual legal analyses are based on hypothetical scenarios. The structure of these narratives, however, that is, the relation between fictional, documentary, and prescriptive legal speech is hardly ever reflected in these narratives. Yet the medium of language is, of course, a good model for approaching the complication of complicity, that is, individually responsible participation in a communal structure. Responsible individual speakers, such as me, hopefully, cannot but use preformed, fanatic, 
semantic and syntactic structures. The relational aspect of human action that poses a problem to legal thought is the focus of literary discourse, which foregrounds language as pre principal medium of human interaction. This is as true for the spoken word as for texts. In analyzing literary discourse, the notion of complicity is useful, not it, because it provides clarity, it does not, never, but because it marks problematic participation, enmeshment, and degrees of responsibility that may evade straightforward legal complicity, uh, culpability. And one such instance of evading straightforward culpability is the usage of terms such as totalitarianism and neoliberalism. Both are highly politicized and often employed for polemical rather than analytical purposes. Totalitarianism is a historiographical concept to describe a particular form of power that controls all aspects of life by way of a mixture of utopianism, scientism, and political violence. But it is more than that. The term was actually adopted by Italy's fascism and Germany's national socialism, became a discursive weapon of the Cold War and a rhetorical stopgap in the present. The same holds true for the economic term neoliberalism, a rather broad and general concept referring to an economic model of paradigm, paradigm that rose to prominence in the 1980s and comprises heterogeneous elements and ideology, a form of governance, a policy, and a form of capitalism. Neoliberalism has become a notorious catchphrase for criticizing the 21st century state of affairs, yet the term was always politicized in as much as it has been conceptualized actually as an ideological counterpart to Stalinist totalitarianism. This pertains to complicity in as much as theoretical concepts thus participate in historical processes as much as they describe them. And while the claim to analytical distance enables an important form of discourse, namely critique, Theoretical language does not grant a position out by, outside the discursive parameter of cultural memory, but enables speakers to participate in this discourse. And this is what I think uh, literary discourse is able to reflect, unlike theoretical language. Complicity is as an ambivalent charge as it is hardly functional within a legalistic framework and too general outside one. Complicity can, however, be analytically productive if used not as a charge, but as a marker for complexity. Analyzing the role of intellectuals in South African apartheid, Mark Sanders distinguishes acting in complicity, which can be legally and ethically judged, from an underlying responsibility in complicity, a connectedness with others that explains why even silence, non-listening, or inactivity may affect the lives of others, mostly in a bad way. I suggest taking responsibility literally here to examine how texts respond to the connectedness with others and their critical role in transmission. And this brings us to point two, spatial tem uh, temporal distancing. Due to their particular possibility of merging fact and fiction, literary texts can address and counteract repression and denial in ways other discourses cannot. However, since literature is part of societal discourse, literary text just as often reproduce strategies of constructing a position of reading untouched by involvement. In portrayals of complicities with mass violence and totalitarianisms in Europe, and I, I focus on that because that's what I know, a crucial mode of maintaining the non-involvement of the present observer is drawing a stark distinction between the present position of the author and the reader in the West vis-a-vis -vis the past violence as belonging to the East, the East of Europe. The distancing is satirized to start with a hopeful example. In Yachim Topol's 2009 novel, Hladno Zemi, that is the devil's workshop, Topo portrays a globalized industry of complacent popular memory politics at the Theresienstadt or Theresien ghetto, one of the sides of an industrialized genocide. And today is Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day, by the way. Um, and he summarizes, Topo summarizes the hierarchy imposed by the current spatial temporal distancing from mass violence and complicity 
nobody, Topol suggests, wants to situate themselves in the East, not even a character speaking in Vladivostok, that is the Pacific railhead of the Trans-Siberian Railway by saying, and I only read the English, East, are you crazy? Why, this is the West, the honest to God end of the West. This is the end of Europe. In absurd mimetic participation in a discourse that defines itself as Western, here the East self eliminates. And that would be funny, but what appears absurd in Topol's 2009 text was mirrored in political rhetoric 10 years later when President of France, Emmanuel Macron, stated at the 2019 press conference held together with President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, at Fort Bresançon, nous croyons dans cette Europe qui va de Lisbonne à Vladivostok. It even rhymes. So we believe in this Europe that goes from Lisbon to Vladivostok. I doubt he read Topol, so this is a real topos. In this gesture of outrage, the represent representative of Western Europe rhetorically incorporates a large part of Asia into Europe and implicitly eliminates any non-Western point of view. This outreach, which Topol satirizes, um, constitutes a bona fide poetics of nostalgia in uh, Valerie Fritsch's 2020 novel Herzklappen von Johnson and Johnson, that is Hard Valves by Johnson and Johnson, and all translations in the following are mine because it's too recent to be translated. This novel portrays Eastern Europe as a hardly inhabited landscape of transgenerational trauma. Fritsch, an Austrian author, tells a story of the silence of perpetrators and its transmission onto the second and the third, and actually also the fourth generation of descendants. If the narrator's grandfather speaks at all, he tells a story of, quote unquote, the war. That's World War II. And she writes, it always sounded wrong and was so confusing that you could mistake the victims for the perpetrators. And it sounded as if the grandfather had not been an active part of it, as if he had not lived through the difficult times himself, and as if the war, which still did not seem to be over, had just happened to him. The grandfather's narrative distancing is mirrored in the narrator. Initially, she fills in the emotional void in his place by way of identification. The narrator enjoys the sad wartime stories, as she says, as a surrogate pain, a vague substitute ache, which fills the void left by her ancestors' silence. <clears throat> she th thus dreams of the destructions her grandfather may have caused during the war and of his suffering as a prisoner of war in a camp in the Kazakh steppe, uh, riding vast plains full of people one moment and empty the next, of treeless landscapes whose vastness and hopelessness cut into one's heart. These dreams are ambivalent. Nightmares at first, they later give rise to the longing for actually seeing the places he had seen. So she writes, mm. she began to dream of going further and further, further into the past and further east, into the war, into grandfather's captivity, into the Kazakh steppe. She knew it was a presumptuous wish and an immoderate one, an impossible time travel, but she was unbothered by this. In fact, both the narrator and the narrative presentation remain unbothered by the self-indulgent nature of the wish to bridge the spatio-temporal gap between her and her grandfather's experience. With the journey, the narrator's unsettling lack of distance from his sequelae of mass violence perpetration is translated into a reenactment of his distancing from his acts. Catalyst of this transmission is the assignment that sets the journey in motion. The narrator's partner, a photographer, is commissioned to find images of post-communist ruins. Uh, she writes, to shoot an extensive photo spread of dilapidated buildings and industrial ruins in the countries of the East, from Ukraine to Azerbaijan. I guess you all know these kinds of um, coffee table books with communist ruins. And of course, on their journey, the couple finds exactly what they're looking for, the ruins of a traumatized landscape. I'm sorry, this is a bit of a longer word. On their way, they encountered abandoned farmhouses, abandoned gas stations, and abandoned villages. Half-collapsed churches where songbirds nested in the rotten prose, 
small chapels without a cross, without God. Industrial cathedrals, chilly and silent. And often not only the places seemed deserted to them, but also the people on the side of the road that one passed. Some seemed derelict like houses. Pritch's text has been met with great critical acclaim for its poetic qualities and portrayal of the transgenerational sequelae of perpetration. Yet this portrayal is very problematic since the text never reflects on the fact that the landscape traversed by the narrator is a geographical display of her heritage of silencing, emotional emptiness, and emphasis on non-involvement. Which ruined East is a soulscape, so to say, leaning on the romanticist aesthetic insight that what renders an area a landscape is that it mirrors the onlookers' emotions. Despite this pedigree, the nostalgic image of a ruined Eastern Europe is problematic because exoticist projection comes at a price, as has been pointed out with reference to other global instances. Looking at the East to find nothing but the ruined heritage of Nazi perpetration and denial forestalls any dialogue with people who actually inhabit this realm today. Acting out the ancestors' suppressed emotions and, as a consequence of this identification, reenacting their distancing from the violated realm amounts to a complicity with past perpetration in as much as it maintains one-sidedness and transmits the point of view of perpetration. I am of course not vouching for the anthropological accuracy of literature, whatever that would be. Basis of my criticism is that as literary texts appeal to audience imagination by citing common assumptions, like Topol cites the obviously common assumption that no one wants to be located in the East, literary texts carry a certain responsibility. What is crucial is how they respond to the issues they address. This response is missing, one would have to say, in Fritsch's text, which portrays the logic of the transgenerational transmission of the sequelae of mass violence perpetration neatly along the lines of what humanities and social sciences research has outlined, but aspires to no reflection on or aesthetic disruption of its logic beyond the portrayal of unhappy self-absorption. This raises two issues relevant beyond literary discourse. First, it points to a link between memory culture and neoconservatism. It has been argued, not by me, that the formation of neoliberalism and the rise of memory are two strictly contemporaneous phenomena, and that this is no coincidence. Unlike a grand receipt of global progress and liberation, for instance, fragmented and subjective memories do not challenge the existence of capitalism. Focusing on family memory rather than historical utopias or problematic historical heritage ties in with neoconservatism, which in turn goes well with neoliberalism due to ins insistence on the status quo. Second, Fritsch's poetics of traumatic projection elucidates a firmer af aspect in Macron's, we remember this, political projection of Europe all over the Asian part of Russia. Both do not reckon with any agency positioned in the Eastern realm. Against the backdrop of Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine, which ties in with the expansionist policy of a Ruski near a Russian world, <clears throat> it becomes clear that Putin may have agreed with Macron's 2019 expansionist outreach, uttered in the first person, person plural as we, um, yet with a very different agenda in mind. Reducing the East to a canvas for traumatic projection or political projects from a point of view which understands itself by contrast as Western renders one unable for encounters and unable to respond to current voices and crises. What is missing in Fritsch's text is an interruption of this projection, a negotiation of ambivalences instead of locating all destruction in remote spaces and times. This is this negotiation of ambivalence is prerequisite to encountering not solely a function of one's own psychic organization, but to facing an actual counterpart or rather adversary and responding to them. The traumatic projection in Fritsch's text is no mere lapse, of course, but mirrors a structural problem. A critical response to the ongoing transmission of discourses that justify, foster, excuse, or deny mass violence 
is always necessary, but particularly challenging with regard to Eastern Europe, as Maria Stepanova's essayistic novel Pamiati Pamiati points out. Stepanova's text discusses the theoretical concept of memory studies, most notably Marianne Hirsch's uh, uh, concept of post-memory. Stepanova challenges the Western bias of memory studies that, that the transgenerational transmission of trauma anachronistically imports psychosocial sequelae of past violence into a present that is profoundly different from that past. Yet political and socioeconomic realities often remain unchanged, even after the demise of terror regimes, as has been argued, for instance, also from a South African point of view. The experience of totalitarianism and political mass violence that spread over several generations also means that, as has been noted, categories such as victims, perpetrators, collaborators, and bystanders often used in Western discourse about World War II are very difficult to apply in Eastern Europe as individuals and groups have often shifted their roles with the many often violent terms in the history of the realm. Consequently, um, Stepanova's narrator traces her family's involvement from a peculiar point of view, and this is, so to say, her response to this problem. She writes, and this is the English translation, in Russia, where violence circulated ceaselessly, society passing from one space of tragedy to the next, as if it were in a suit of rooms, a suit of traumas, from war to revolution to famine and mass persecution on, on to new wars, new persecutions, the territory for this hybrid memory formed earlier than in other countries. The Russian original of the text speaks not of a suit of traumas, but of a traumatic enfilade, traumaticuskaya enfilada. The French enfilade denotes a suit of rooms, as you can see it here, where all connecting doors are aligned in the single axis. Crucial for Stepanova's text is that the suit can only be seen from a point of view aligned with that axis, not from outside the alignment. Enfilades are part of feudal architectural grandeur, as you can see. The notion of a traumatic enfilade suggests that starting with Tsarist despotism, the sequence of historical events in Russia and the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 21st centuries have created the point of view from where an observer cannot claim to look back at a distant past, but speaks from within an ongoing transmission of terror and violence that requires critical reflection in order not to participate in the reproduction of the sequelae of victimization, perpetration, and complicity. With this, it's time to come finally uh, to the second strategy of distancing that I promised to explore to moral distancing. There can be no doubt, of course, that mass violence deserves moral condemnation. What I call moral distancing, for the lack of a better term, is the strategy to secure the author's and the reader's non-involvement in the portrait acts of terror and mass violence by casting them as morally and often also intellectually superior, superior to portrait complicit characters. This moral high ground is problematic because it presumes that there is no ongoing transmission of discourses which justify, foster, excuse, or deny perpetration or complicity, which allows audiences to consume a supposedly disconnected, horrific past as exotic alterity. However, the very presumption of profound moral distance, a presumption such a, that it can't happen here or now, is a seminal precondition for transmitting such discourses, notably as the consumption of the past as exciting entertainment is prone to aesthetically reproduce victimization by turning suffering into a spectacle. Complicity in memorialization and commodification is in focus of Elfriede Jelinek's uh, 2008 play Rechnitz, The Extermination Angel, um, Jelinek's text portrays the transmission of local knowledge about a 1945 massacre near the Austrian town of Rechnitz, close to the Hungarian border, where a few days before the arrival of the Red Army at a dinner party hosted by Marit von Bacchany, daughter of Heinrich Thyssen, the weapon industrial tycoon, at a local castle, 180 to 200 Hungarian Jews were shot by party guests. Most of the victims' bodies have not been found to this day, 
and the known perpetrators have evaded prosecution. A 1994 documentary film uh, entitled Totschweigen or Wall of Silence portrays an un unsuccessful campaign to recover the bodies as well as the locals report on the event. A local hunter, this is one of the film skills, a local hunter points out one of the many assumed sites of the massacre and the mass grave and comments on it. And this is his odd grammar, not mine. I just translated it literally. We are on the side, I would say, where the tragedy approximately happened. Pointing upward, he closes uh, his statement just a few seconds later. If this turns out not to be the place, and it is not found, the mass grave that is, one should more or less leave the affair to the almighty and finally, I would almost say, be quiet. This is an illustration of what it means for perpetrators, accomplices, and their descendants to call mass violence a tragedy. It means not calling it murder, casting it as rule of a superior force so that no one is a responsible actor with intent, and implying that the victims were guilty of some hubris punished by their quote unquote tragic fate, which is not only the logic of Attic tragedy, but also, as we know, a key element of anti Semitism. Jelinek's play desists from giving a clear account of the massacre itself, and thus responds drastically to the question of whether the representation of past violence should become a source of entertainment or consolation for the spectator. This is issues by no means detached, interestingly, from understanding historical mass massacring, which, as historian Jacques Semlin puts it, is the most spectacular practice which those in power have at their disposal to assert their ascendancy. If this is true, then massacre wants to be watched. In order not to assume a position in this order of violence, not to confirm the logic of massacre by way of mimetic participation, Jelinek focuses on the local testimonies, on the cruelty and denial that is not passed, but still passed on by a multitude of voices that seem to testify to events while claiming their personal non-involvement, of course. And one of these voices says, as a messenger, I would have certainly liked to provide you with more reliable written records, but that would have made me a witness and possibly liable for prosecution just because I might have seen what others saw and the emphasis is on others. There were others who saw what I saw in, plight, in plain sight, even of the Holy See. So what do you want from me? This translation differs slightly from the German original in that it harps on an English homonym to link the act of seeing to the inactivity of the Holy See, i.e. to Pope Pius XII. The German text rather links the act of seeing, sehen, to the respectable Angusian status of the many inactive witnesses. Thus exploring what follows from seeing and witnessing, Rechnitz can be said to establish a poetical distinction akin to the terminological distinction drawn by Sanders, and I showed you this before. So she draws a distinction, I would say, between, on the one hand, responsibility and complicity, i.e., between how her text responds to violence, namely by not portraying it as a source of amusement, and on the other hand, acting in complicity, which is staged by actors. Their complicity lies in the way they fulfill their role as messenger. They, their aim is not to reveal what happened out of plain sight as in tragic or biblical messengers, but rather to prevent clarity while also enjoying the importance of the role of the messenger. This requires not telling anything while also talking all the time, indicating just enough to make clear that there is a secret, a thrillingly atrocious secret to uncover like this voice. I could also tell you where it will not be easy to find those bodies. No, nothing will be easy to find. But I say nothing, otherwise it would be e too easy a find and much too easy a finale. Focusing on messengers rather than historical events, Jelinek's poetics of anonymous voices performs, as one critic writes with reference to earlier plays, those complicit practices and ways of thinking that bring about cultural politics of exclusionary and annihilating violence. Jelinek's focus on the transmission of justificatory discourses, however, also reflects on the distancing implied in the gesture, in the gesture of finding others complicit in mass violence and 
totalitarianism, a distancing that the film, we saw it before, allows too. For it is easy to dismiss the pictured gentleman as old Nazi to feel morally and intellectually superior to him. And I link the novel and the film because uh, Jelena quotes this uh, uh, documentary as one of her sources. <clears throat> and it might not even be wrong to uh, feel morally superior and to suspect that he might be an old Nazi. However, the distancing effect of this moral high ground is problematic, and this can be seen uh, in Eva Menasse's 2021 novel Dunkelblum, also not yet translated, therefore translated by myself, which is based on the Rechnitz massacre without spelling out the name. The narrative <clears throat> position in Menasse's text are clear cut and free from all ambivalence when a third part person omniscient narrator sorts out a few good characters among many parodically bad ones. And I only uh, quote one passage. People often didn't finish their sentences, a good strategy with, with such topics, topics such as massacre. One hinted at what one thought and still had not said a thing. Later, there was some laughter and a few dirty jokes. In truth, they were on the lookout for news, unsure whether to reckon with something annoying or sensational. The reader is here invited to share the narrator's moral superiority of knowing in truth that the novel's characters are voyeuristic, and they're invited to deflect his or her own pleasure in reading about them and the detective story of uncovering atrocities. Jelinek's text impedes such complacent pleasure by questioning the role of the audience, of the theater audience, in the portrayal of historical acts of mass violence. Why watch or read, in short, consume the reproduction of this desolate speech of repression or denial? To create distance, one of the text voices uh, suggests in neoliberal rather than psychological terms. We transfer good and evil to where we are not. That is how it's done, it's called outsourcing. The identification of perpetrators and accomplices creates the good conscience of not being guilty oneself, the consolation of knowing who is, and it also allows the campaign to recover the massacre's victims to turn into a narrative of suspense. In conclusion, Yelinek's text expounds not least the ambivalence of its genre. Documentary fiction creates attention for the suffering of victims, for the rationalization of perpetration, and for the issue of complicity in the transmission of justificatory discourses by making the audience participate in this very complicity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliana, for this wonderfully rich and inspiring, engaging talk. I particularly enjoy the way in which you touched upon how some of the, you know, discourses, memory discourses don't really apply to the Eastern context that really resonated with me. So I really enjoyed the talk. Um, before I um, go on, it's like, it's like, as a chair, usually chairs can ask questions, but before I start asking a question, I'm just wondering if anybody would like to start us off with a question of their own. And just to remind uh, our audience that you can raise your hand or which is at the bottom of the screen under the reactions icon, and then you can ask your question in person, or you can write um, or submit your question to the Zoom chat. Either option would work, and we will try to get as many questions as possible. So please, if anybody would like to ask questions. OK. <laughs> OK, I'm happy to ask the first one. Um, so you were mentioning uh, in your talk the position of the reader, which for me as a film scholar is always the position of the spectator. I think you also mentioned that in relation to the position of the narrator mm -hmm. and how there is a, um, in your first category, you were mentioning this uh, spatial, um, his, uh, spatial and temporal distance. And I was wondering if in any ways the concepts that you're working with here 
are connected to Rothberg's uh, uh, diachronic and synchronic notions of implication. If you ah. consider that in that sense, because you're introducing something new, it's like this uh, spatial kind of connection and the landscape things are very interesting there. So, uh, um, sorry, I just have to note that down, otherwise I forget it. Um, uh, I hadn't thought of that uh, because that's a relatively fairly recent thought, but that's an interesting um, hint. And also I, I should have thought of that given that I wrote an article about his book. And I also, uh, it, it appeared to me when you uh, uh, read the title of my talk that it's, it has implication in it, but I don't actually say anything about implication. Um, but that would be a wider thing. Um, so to, to sum this article up a bit, and that's maybe why I didn't think about it, um, while I uh, I like his book a lot, I am a bit more, I don't know, Eastern European skeptical about his outlook uh, that there might be a way not to be implicated in wrongdoing. And I think as human beings, if there was a way, we would come up with it by now. Um, so I think um, the only, there's no way of, uh, other scholars call this, we have to fight for non-complicity, but I think this is, uh, and Rothberg himself says that this is narcissistic, but because that's just about me and my importance of not being complicit, and it doesn't care much about what effect that has on others. But I, I yes, I must admit, I, I should have a look onto this synchronic and diachronic. And also, uh, given that you mentioned that, um, of course, uh, uh, the reference or well, the link between narrator and reader and spectator could also be differentiated more because obviously not every book, um, not in every book there is a clear alignment between the narrator's position and also uh, the readers, or I don't know about movies so much, but I would guess the same uh, with the whole unreliable narrator thing or um, uh, the, the how is, are these bienveillance called in English? The very thick book about the perpetrator in Eastern Europe, you know where my The kindly ones. Uh, yes, thank you, the kindly ones. Uh, in that book, obviously, the reader is not invited, and there has been a lot of clever literature about that. Um, the reader is not invited to join the narrator's view, uh, a, a view onto things. I just uh, kept with a very simplistic description here because in, um, at least in Fritsch's case, there is no distinction. One is not invited to non-identify because that this is a full-on identificatory narrative. You are supposed to emotionally uh, identify with, uh, with the narrative. Thank you. So thank you too for this implicit hint. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Oh, we've got questions. That's great. Uh, uh, Joe Petit, would you like to voice your question? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julianne, for such a really fascinating paper. I really enjoyed it. I was thinking, and this is really um, bouncing off the, the previous question, uh, about the role of the reader. And I, and I was intrigued by what you were just saying about this sort of direct identification and whether or not the reader is really I, um, invited to identify with these characters. Because actually, it seems to me that there are some complications there that I find myself really intriguing. So on the one hand, I think I can speak for everyone, at least in this digital room, when we sit down to read a book about Nazis, we're already, or any perpetrator of, of this kind, we're already positioned to reject the character yeah, yeah. But before we start reading. Um, and, but there, there is even more than that. Pet, Petra Rao has this really cool quote, which I, I quote everywhere because I really like it. She talks about having uh, having your Nazi cake and eating it. I we <laughs> we actually we get some kind of weird pleasure from playing at entering the mind of perpetrators, from entering them, but at the same time having this moral separation and knowing that we ourselves are superior. Um, so I think there's a really um, intriguing response and um, reception to these characters and I, I, I just wonder whether that's come up in any of the texts that you're looking at. Could, could you type uh, the author of that quote in, in the chat? Sure, and yeah. it, uh, 
uh, listening out names. Um, what is, uh, the, the identification is, of course, only true for uh, the setting of the novels that I'm interested in, uh, where it's like in Fritsch, but also in Stepanova a bit, though she reflects on the identification. Thank you so much. Um, um, uh, where it is a, a descendant, a critical descendant engaging with uh, mostly her, uh, but also sometimes his ancestors' crimes. And so the, there is supposed to be a critical distance between these two. Um, and that's what makes it inviting for the reader because it is assumed in most of the literature that we the reader would have the same stance of being critical in distance. And then, and what I, um, this is not true for Stepanova, she reflects on that, but it is very true for texts like, um, and I hope I insult no one here, but it is true for texts uh, like uh, Menasses and Fritsch that it's e very easy to fall into this uh, invitation of, oh, look how, how critical I am. I'm not only am I critical, I'm also actively engaging with this terrible past. And that, that becomes like a, you know, a token uh, to yeah. hand around. And both of these novels, I mean, of, of course, um, uh, authors want to sell novels. And it's, an, it's a coincidence that both of them are Austrian authors. I have no point against Austrian, Austrian authors. Um, and that, I think, is a very recent trend, that these books sell good because I think um, at least it, it appeals to something that is very well complacent or as Rothberg would say narcissistic so look at how critical I am I'm, I'm such a good girl or guy um and for that uh it, it it's actually true they uh yeah eat the not um have the Nazi cake and eat it um and that I think is not only you know in itself somewhat morally um complicated but it it is an instance of distancing that I think is um, problematic, for instance, in not reflecting on the pleasure, while Jelinek makes it really painful to read or look the, uh, or watch uh, uh, the performance of this text, or um, uh, Stepanova, and of course also others, um, uh, kind of um, disrupt uh, this pleasure, uh, Stepanova, by dis lengthy discussions of critical concepts, uh, which are also enjoyable. I, I don't want to talk the text down, but they are they don't allow for identification. Or others like Topol, he has a very uh, sharp irony that uh, like destroys all possibility of identification. Um, so they respond to this issue. But thank you for making me aware of this quote. That's great. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Lena Sov, if you would like to come in and ask your question. We can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. It's at the bottom of the screen. Next Sorry. To you. Yeah. Sorry, I, I was still muted. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that um, for that talk. I have um, a rather technical question um, about one of the terms you, you used. Um, you, you talked about um, documentary fiction, and um, I'm I'm just really interested in 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 what what that what kind of a genre that that is. Because I mean, I'm, I am you described the text, but um, still. Yeah, and may I ask what your what your disciplinary background is i'm um i'm a literary scholar okay because i'm i'm used to talking to a lot of historians and political scientists and i would have to uh, mend my uh, response differently in that case um uh I, I'm, I'm happy you asked that i did not unfortunately i had to find out i, I didn't make up this con uh, concept someone came up with it before uh, I thought, but it, I didn't. I didn't sit down to make up a concept. I thought it was out there, and I just recently discovered it's. It seems to not be a very conventional one. What I want to describe is that it. Um, I should have probably added that. Is um, these are something very lowbrow actually. So these texts portray, or they are based on historical. Uh, you could. No, well, 
they're based on historical events like the Rechnitz massacre actually happened or Stepanova has actual sources for family history. Uh, and uh, Fritsch, I left that out, but one of the few points, or actually the one point in Eastern Europe that stands out, but without any elucidation, is um, uh, a Ukrainian town, uh, the name of which will reappear to me, where a massacre happened. Of course, I didn't print that. Out. It will, Trovovich is at the town. Uh, that's the only town name she mentions uh, where um, uh, uh, a massacre actually happened. But these, um, so these historical events are negotiated in fictional plot because very often there are no sources and or the thing that Rechnitz negotiates is that no one knows. Um, and I don't call this historical fiction because that's a bit like, you know, out there with, uh, with, with rather very um, entertaining uh, mm -hmm. novels. I call it documentary fiction, of course, for the lure of, of, of the opposition that implies because, and that's why I asked whether you were a historian because they take, take offense with that. Mm -hmm. It can be fictional in the documentary. Um, but then, of course, as literary scholars, we know that all narratives are formed, so poetic forming in a way. But the documentary is still important because um, what makes this text interesting is that um, at least the complex ones do not claim to only give a, you know, a nice or atrocious story, but actually try to, uh, to pick to, together, um, well, to document these cases and in many, uh, in many instances, um, they reflect on, uh, say, massacres or events or aspects of violence that have not stood out in, not exactly stood out in, in the work of historians. Like um, when Topol speaks of uh, Theresienstadt, he's not so, uh, he, he doesn't focus on, on uh, what happened there when it was a Nazi ghetto, because we know that. He's interested in what happened before and what happened after that in communism, which is also very uh, telling and interesting. Um, or uh, it is very, uh, uh, for uh, Stepanova, it's important to not isolate uh, Stalinist or Nazi atrocities, but to see them, how they uh, mold human experience as, as a sequence of events. Um, and that's why I think that the, the, the documentary part, uh, as opposed to historical part, is important because it, uh, uh, these texts try to, and then I'm done with the response, uh, they, they try to reflect on the fact that history is as a narrative that has to be formed too. And uh, documenting things is, is a, a gesture that's more open to ambivalences, to things that cannot be explained, to, you know, maybe the somewhat naive uh, gesture of just facing facts first, but that's what we do have to do. That's why I think uh, it's more aptly called documentary than historical fiction. But thank you for the question. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I am mindful of the time. Uh, but we still have one raised hand, so let's address that question, Guido. Yes, indeed, I will be super brief. So thanks, thanks so much, Juliana. You you spoke about the responsibility of the text. You spoke about the responsibility of the reader who is involved in the act of of reading in the construction of of, of the meaning and then the pleasure that can be created and can be problematic. I would like to ask, in your opinion, what, what is the responsibility of the scholars in uh, approaching these issues, if you see it more in terms of uh, uh, the work we do uh, to deconstruct the narratives, to criticize them, or if then teaching is a, a powerful and important part of that. I would like to know your opinion on, on that. Thanks. Uh, given that uh, a number of students of mine are uh, present, I of course have to underline that teaching is very important. Um, but I and I had I have a very heavy deconstructive schooling, which also made me aware of, um, say, 
the problematic aspects of that gesture. So I think one of our, uh, uh, or as I see my, my own work is to, uh, in teaching and also in, in, in wider scholarship, to understand the different modes uh, or the difference between, uh, say, different discourses or, or ways of speech. There is, uh, of course, there is a point in historians um, forming history as a factual narrative. Um, and there's also a point in legal scholars uh, discussing, uh, you know, um, war crimes. But uh, this is uh, this approach to facts isn't everything a society needs to know or to come to terms with. Well, what do we do with these things? And I think, um, or at least the, the work I'm currently doing is just making these different kinds of discourses speak to each other because very often, so I read a lot about complicity in literature and not actually, not, I mean, not to praise myself too much, but not many people there care to actually read the juridical literature and to find out, well, what's, what do these guys actually mean by complicity? I don't have to just buy that, but I mean, they're not stupid, so they might have thought something too. And, and that I think is important. And, and we're probably as focusing on language in literary criticism is better in making these different disciplines and discourses understand each other. Um, and uh, primarily to make others understand that yes, it's fact-based, but all of that is a narrative. And this narrative of history is always informed by our requirements of the present. And that's not necessarily forging facts. It's just history is continuously reformulated so that we understand it. But of course, that implies, um, when I mentioned the memory wars, that also um, comprises the problematic um, usage that uh, Russia is currently making of the formulation of historical narrative. And it, I think it's important to understand that this is not a complete aberration but unfortunately, one of the sinister sides of how history works. Otherwise, we don't understand how that comes to pass. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful answer. It's like it's a whole new topic opening up here. But um, unfortunately, we need to stop. So. I would like us to end by giving another round of applause to Juliane. Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. And to thank you, all of you here, for being here, for sharing your questions, for commenting. And we look forward to welcoming you back and continue exploring these questions of complicity and responsibility with as many of you as possible at our next keynote lecture. Which, is, uh, which will take place next week, as I said, May the 4th, and it's delivered by, it will be delivered by David Martin Jones, Professor of Film Studies at the University of Glasgow. And I'll just quickly pop in in the chat the link where you can register for the talk. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here and hope to see you next time. <laughs>